All right, guys, this is your chapter six lecture. I will caution you that I have omitted a lot of information that's in the book in chapter six. If we don't go over it here and on the PowerPoint, then you do not need to know it. We just in eight weeks can't cover everything that's in the book. So be sure you look at this um, lecture, examine the PowerPoint, because that's the only information that you will be tested on. The book's going to have a whole lot of more information. Let me go ahead and get the PowerPoint started for you. Okay, chapter six, we're still talking about the police. Remember your three pieces of the criminal justice system, police, courts, jails. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, their purpose and how they are organized. There is an overall police mission and these are given in the book as enforce the law, investigate crimes, and apprehend the offenders. In other words, figure out who done it and go put the bad guys away, prevent crime from ever happening at all, ensure domestic peace and tranquility, making sure that people are getting along and treating each other properly, and provide enforcement services to the community. So what the community needs, they're there to help with. That's the overall mission. Um, looking at that mission and breaking it down, enforcing the law, we know that these police agencies are the primary enforcers of criminal laws. They are, when somebody commits a crime, they are the ones that have to respond. And when I say they, remember we could be talking about local, we could be talking about state, we could be talking about um, federal. They see themselves as crime fighters. That's their job is to try to um, solve crime, prevent crimes. That's, that's how they see themselves. However, enforcing those types of laws and doing those types of investigations like we watch TV shows about, that's not their only job. They do spend a lot of their time on non-emergency calls, traffic, writing tickets, things that you and I, you know, those of us who are just TV watchers might not consider too exciting. And we also know it's impossible to enforce all of the laws. I mean, every time you cross a street and you're not in a crosswalk, you know, have you violated the law? Maybe so, that's jaywalking. Are they out there to arrest you for it? Of course not. Apprehending offenders. Sometimes um, the bad guys are caught while they're still com committing the crime or maybe immediately afterwards. They committed the crime and ran off and the police caught up with them. A lot of them are not caught until there is an investigation. We have several people in this class who that's what they do is investigate. They go out and figure out who did it and they may be catching them after the fact. There's just different types of police work that has to be done to catch those offenders. I have attached two videos. And again, I'm not gonna stop during this lecture to watch, but I would encourage you on the PowerPoint to watch them. The first one explains what happened with the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, it came before September 11th. It was the largest domestic killing of human beings that we had seen at that point. It was a big deal. The first one explains that. It shows you what the building looked like, um, tells you how many were killed. I think it was 168, if I recall. The second one tells you how they caught the guy. It is just almost unbelievable how they caught the guy and the randomness of where it happened. So police officers never know exactly what their day is going to bring to them when they head out in the morning. Uh, this gentleman that's interviewed on the second video here, he definitely didn't know what was in store for him. So just an interesting aside on different types of police work and how sometimes the way you think it goes down is not the way it goes down. So again, the third thing on their mission is to prevent crime. And they want to try to take a proactive approach here when you say prevent. In other words, we're trying to anticipate, recognize the situation, appraise the risk that's involved, and maybe do something beforehand. Um, act before that crime happens, which may have kept it from happening at all. You know, that's why they may be at certain gatherings of people. They may be in certain situations because they've anticipated that that situation may lead to crimes being occurred. So they're trying to keep that from happening. They're trying to lower the potential rewards of criminal activity and lessen the public sphere of crime. So we all feel safer if we see policemen around. You know, I've always said I wanted to move into a neighborhood where the guy next to me had a police car that he drove and was parked in his driveway every night. Um, because that seems to bring our fear of crime. Who's going to come commit a crime on the policeman? 
you know. Um, but a lot of it depends on community involvement. In other words, the police have to get the word that something's going down sometimes for them to know to be there to stop the crime from happening. So we do have to stay involved as a community and pass that information on. Remember, ensuring domestic peace and tranquility was the fourth um, piece of the mission. And this is a this is very broad. This could be things such as try, getting involved um, in crime reduction and even peacekeeping strategy. And when I say that, excessive noise, graffiti, abandoned cars, you know, vandalism, panhandling the guys that are out there saying, you know, I'm hungry, anything you can give, prostitution, seeing the drunk people. It, it's just trying to keep those situations from turning into worse situations. So they're often involved in these, what they call quality of life offenses. Let's just make this better for everybody around. Um, so that's what preserving the peace means. And providing the services, most of the service that we get is the 911 system. That's for emergencies. Obviously, we all know if we have that emergency, we call 911. We have several dispatchers in our class who um, I'm sure could give us a lot of information about the types of calls that come through on 911. And if y'all wanna send me some sort of message that you know you think it would be a great discussion board, I'm happy to do that. I don't wanna put you on the spot though. Some areas have started a 311 system for non-emergency calls, but it's just the police, that's their mission is to provide these types of services so that people know they can reach out to them and they're gonna help and take care of them. So they have some core operational strategies to help them achieve the mission. The mission being the five things we just went over. And these core operational strategies include preventive patrol, routine incident response, emergency response, criminal investigations, and problem solving. And we're gonna talk through those one at a time here. Preventive patrol, you can probably figure out is, we're gonna put an officer out there where people can see him to hope that that's going to keep somebody from committing the crime already, from even starting. The bad guy who was on his way to do the crime sees the police officer either walking up and down the street or driving up and down the street, and maybe that's what stops him from committing the crime that day. Maybe they interrupt crimes that are in progress. Let's catch them as they're going down. That's the purpose of having patrol where people are out driving around already in the community then you have them hopefully already very close to where a crime may be in progress that they could even get there before the crime is finished. And we're going to position those officers for quick response. You know, the Ascension Sheriff's Office has broken down some different districts now in Donaldsonville and, you know, where they got the big office there across from Snows on Airline, they have one in Prairieville. So they have different offices, different officers who hopefully are out in different areas and assigned to those particular areas so that they can respond quickly. And why are we putting the patrol out there besides deterring, interrupting and quick responses? Because we want the public to feel safe and secure. We may not like it when we're driving down the highway, going a little over the speed limit, and we see that police officer, and we know what do we all do, slam on the brakes. Even if we're not speeding, we all slam on the brakes. Um, but I do know that we do feel safer and more secure if we feel like a police officer is near because we hope everybody else is responding to that police officer like we are, and that is, what am I doing wrong? I better stop. <laughs> I don't want to get a ticket or get arrested. There's a lot of interactive um, patrols as well. Um, I, I, we don't have a lot on foot here, you know, because we you have to basically have transportation in our community that we live in. But go visit New York City. And there's just so many of them that are just on foot. Obviously, they have automobiles. That's what we see mostly here is um, either cars or motorcycles. We do I do see the sheriff's office motorcycle people out a good bit. There are some on horseback. Again, go to New York City. You see a lot of them on horseback there. Also, I see a good many when I'm in New York City on bicycle because it's for that particular geographical setting, it's more efficient. You know, cars, driving cars down the streets of New York City is often very difficult. It is just massive traffic. But somebody on a bicycle or a horse, they can fit through those cars, around those cars, and get where they need to get to to try to, to catch the bad guy. You just may not have known that also there are boats 
Um, I got a tour one time of the training facility the sheriff's office has over there across from Lamar Dixon. And my goodness, they have so many different types of equipment back there. Not all only owned by our sheriff's department. Some of the sheriff's you know, in general, sheriffs go together and buy equipment sometimes, and some of that is stored there. We have canines, you know, that's dogs. They have the police dogs, and those, I think all three of my parishes, and no assumption has a canine unit as well. And then some of them have aerial capacity, meaning they have helicopters usually. Um, even some have airplanes if needed. So there's all different types of interactive patrols where they are trying to give them the best access to their particular geographical restrictions as possible. The next operational strategy is routine incident response. Okay, so you had to call into the police and we need somebody to respond. They're gonna collect the information. They typically write a report. We're trying to restore the order. Let's get things back to everybody safe, document all the information, and maybe something needs to be done right that moment. Um, response time is something you'll hear a lot about. This is what's so strange is the Kansas City experiment that we talked about uh, in chapter five, where I said the different levels of patrol didn't affect the how much crime was being committed, nor what people felt, you know, their fear of crimes. It also didn't response time wasn't the key factor there. That's not generally the belief though, because most of the time when you make your call to the police department, how long it takes them to get to you vastly affects whether you're satisfied or not. In other words, you know, if you're sitting there for 30 minutes and you can't, um, I don't know, you, you, you feel like you've just been abandoned, left alone, nobody's paying attention. You're obviously very dissatisfied with the police. So their time to respond does seem to be directly linked to citizen satisfaction, which again, if you go back to what we talked about, that's why we put them out in the community. We want them to be available. We don't want them sitting at this particular office and that's it because they're always gonna be a certain distance away from where certain crimes are committed. Emergency response. With the emergency response, it could be for crimes in progress. It could be natural disasters. It could be terrorism. Um, could be officer assistance. You know, often we've all watched the terrible shows or, or clips even of, you know, real situations where it's officer down, officer down, and they're, you know, screaming for uh, emergency response and emergency backup. But it's normally we're talking about these critical type incidents where human life is in jeopardy. It will take priority over everything else. So if you're ever, you've ever got the officer there getting the report on your stolen lawnmower, and all of a sudden one of these life-threatening events happens, they may jump in the car and leave because they have got to go handle the life-threatening events first. They do um, often provide first aid, hostage rescue, capture of suspects. That's what you hope the emergency response is gonna take care of. So that's another one of their operational strategies. Criminal investigations. So the crime has occurred, but the bad guy's gone and we gotta figure out who did it. We have at least one investigator I read in the personal notes uh, with the sheriff's office. Um, this is the process of gathering all the information, trying to figure out what happened and who is responsible. Now, the criminal investigation is also broken down into several pieces. Initially, you'll have the first responders. Those are going to be the first ones on a scene. They're going to provide that emergency assistance, meaning we're going to take care of any wounded you know, people who need immediate help, they're going to capture the suspects if they're there and they're going to secure the crime scene so that it's not tainted. And again, if you're like me and you watch all the whodunits, you know full well, you can't have people walking in and out through the crime scene, touching things and all. So they want to secure that crime scene so that it remains clean um, for the, the ones who come in after those first responders. And obviously the crime scene is the physical area where the crime is thought to have occurred. When we're talking about the crime scene, surely all of you have watched at least enough police um, TV shows to know most of the time they'll put that yellow tape out on TV and you can see the crime scene and nobody can get through it and all. Well, that's the physical area we're talking about. So 
Um, most of the TV shows that we do watch are in this area of investigation. What's a little bit, I think my investigators would say is what's a little bit false is that they're able to gather all their information and solve the crime in the 55 minutes that they have on TV. <laughs> That's not exactly the way it works in real life. However, the preliminary investigation, um, we're going to break that down into the, first of all, you're there at the beginning. That's what this, we're talking about at the beginning. So that investigator is responding to the immediate needs, aids the injured, is going to note any key facts, provide uh, headquarters with an assessment of the scene, try to determine if a crime was committed, taking any enforcement action if needed, meaning, you know, if we've got somebody there to arrest, we're going to arrest them, secure them, uh, protect the evidence. Again, we're going to get it sealed off so that any of the evidence that might be in the crime scene is not going to be tainted. And if necessary, pursue and arrest the person. If they're still there when they get there and they see them take off, they're going to take off after all. So these are the ones who were there immediately, the preliminary investigation. The crime scene investigators are the ones that are going to come in with the forensics, such as the, are we going to be able to find DNA, fingerprints, um, photographs, interviewing the witnesses. They're really digging in a little deeper, trying to get the evidence to figure out again what happened here and who is responsible for it. Now, problem solving is the next operational strategy. Again, five mission, five statements of mission. Now we've been through these operational strategies. Problem solving is the next one. And this is problem-oriented policing. It's trying to reduce chronic offending in a community. So chronic offending meanings, means the same things happening over and over, a lot of times the same people. I'm sure if I spoke to my deputies that are here in this class, and I can tell you at the courthouse, we do see a lot of the same people over and over doing the same crimes. Obviously, drugs plays a big part in that. So problem solving is one of their strategies to try to figure out a way, how can we break the chain? What can we do to try to to keep this from being the same people and the same crimes. Um, that's the problem solving. And then we have um, support services, which again, now we're looking at operational strategies. And we have several of these people who are in, uh, employed by the sheriff's office in these capacities. Dispatch, I've got several dispatchers. There are some deputies who I say, I'll call every one of them a deputy. They all have rank. Remember, they're under military. But there are some of the Ascension Paris, for instance, sheriff's office, who their job is to train the other officers. That's their job. They're not out. The, they're not the ones out there doing that actual work. They're back training the ones to do the actual work. Human resources. They have to have payroll. They have to have all that, in, you know, the same stuff that every other employer has to have. Property and evidence control. Well, when they take up this evidence at the crime scene, they've got to have a safe, secure place to log it in. You have to watch the chain of command, meaning who's had their hands on it. Could it have been tainted any, anywhere along the line? And of course, record keeping. There's a report filed for everything. So somebody got to be in charge of taking care of all that, those reports. So those are people who are also um, working in law enforcement. They are support services. They keep these agencies running. They get the de they deliver the resources necessary to support those officers that are out in the field that you might see when you make the call. Um, police organization. Let's talk about that. So you have management in a police organization. And there are administrative activities that control, direct, coordinate personnel, resources, and activities. Obviously, this is your leadership, your sheriff, and those who are closest to him deciding who works where, where do we direct the money, where do we direct these jobs, who, what's the best way to run this agency. That's what management does. There are key roles within the sheriff's office, and I keep saying sheriff because it is, it's, considerably larger than GPD, and um, I'm just a little more familiar with it because they do work more in my courthouse and all. You have the field and the supervisory activities related to daily police work, the line operations. They are out on the line doing the actual police work. That's the one driving around in the patrol car, 
who gets the call and pulls up at the scene. That's the one who gets you for speeding. They are out there doing the real work. That's line operations. Staff operations are the ones who are doing the support roles. That is your administration. That's your dispatch. That's your HR people. Um, the dispatch would probably say, no, I'm doing the I'm doing the actual daily police work. And that may well be. Uh, you probably have a really good argument there. And I may have it classified wrong, as I think the book may have it that way, too. But in any event, you do need to know line operations versus staff operations. Line are the ones doing the actual what you and I would call police work. You know, they're solving the crime. They're trying to catch the bad guy. Staff operations are those who are supporting that role, the administration, making sure the agency still runs, everybody getting their paycheck, <laughs> that type of thing. You do need to know this. There is a chain of command within um, a police department. Um, and you have to know the difference here between chain of command and span of control. The chain of command is who reports to who. So it's kind of seeing an organizational chart. You can go to any Ascension Parish. And again, I call them all, I call y'all all deputies. And I know I have some in this class. So when I'm probably in, insulting you by calling you a deputy, but you can go to any Ascension Parish Sheriff's employee and ask them, who is your supervisor? And every one of them will know. They'll know who their supervisor is. So the order of authority is looking, for instance, at that particular um, organizational chart and seeing who does this person report to? Well, they report to the person above. Well, that person above may have a couple of different divisions that report to him. And of course, it, it all comes up the chain to the sheriff. But that's the chain of command. Who reports to who? Now, the span of control looks at it from the other direction and says, how many personnel or units do you supervise? Go to a particular commander, supervisor, and say, what is the span of who you control? So it's the number of unit or personnel um, that, that he supervises. So it's kind of looking at it from both ways. But you absolutely need to know chain of command, span of control, line operation, staff operation. You definitely need to know that. Now, I know you're going to be excited to know that that is all you need to know from Chapter 6. Very short, very quick, to the point. Um, you have review questions to do in Chapter 6, and um, you have a discussion board that is also due this week. So I will be posting an interview now, I did this interview live, so you're going to see one student had signed in, but I did this interview live about a year ago, and so uh, I kept it because it's pretty good, and all of my APSO people will probably know Danielle Plaisance. That's who was interviewed in this um, tape that I'm going to post, and then you have some questions on a discussion board to answer there. All right, have a great week. And send me a message if you have any trouble, but please, please, please read directions. I'm going to run out of time and patience and availability of helping you out of these jams that you're putting yourself in. So push hard, work hard. That's all I can tell you. It's a lot of information. Um, we are three weeks. This is the week three assignments that we've got today. So push hard and let's stick this out for the eight weeks.